Welcome back to another part in the MVVM Jetpack Compose course for beginners. In this part, we're gonna work on solving the problem of process death. And if you don't know what process death is, don't worry, let's get into a demo right now and I will show you. Process death is a plague that affects all applications. Yes, every single application, you should have a strategy for handling process death. So here we are in the app. I'm gonna scroll down to you know some page. Actually, let me select a category because I want to um, showcase the that the category information is also lost. So I'm gonna click on chicken here. And now to trigger process death, this is what you need to do. There's a couple ways to do it, but this is the way that I always do it. So select a category. Let's you know scroll to somewhere in the app. You know basically just do something in the app. Now send it to the background. So I'm, I just clicked the uh, the center button right here, the home button, and sent that app to the background. Now I'm on Windows, so I'm going to open up a Windows Explorer, and I need to go to wherever platform tools is in my on my computer. So for me, that means going to users, Mitch, app data, local, Android, SDK, and then platform tools. So now inside of platform tools, we can get access to ADB. We need to use ADB because we need to access the, the Linux operating system that's working on the phone because we need to use that Linux operating system to then kill the process that the app is running in on the phone. So I'm gonna write CMD here to open up a command prompt to this directory. So now here I am inside of platform tools. Now I want to, if you want to view all of the kind of active processes that are running on the phone, just write, first of all, ADB shell to get into the ADB shell. You can see that I'm using a OnePlus phone. You can see there it says OnePlus 5. That's the model of my phone. Now we're inside of, we're essentially inside of like a Linux terminal accessing the operating system on the phone. So I can write PS for processes dash all and that's going to show all the running processes on my phone so these are like all of the apps that are you know currently running on the phone there's a whole bunch of them not all of them obviously are ones that you've installed there's ones that just come with the phone so let me clear that by writing cls um oh that's not a command inside of linux sorry that was a windows uh, what is it, CLR? I don't remember. Okay, I won't clear because I don't remember the command. But <laughs> now let's find the process that the app, the MVVM app is running in. So I'm gonna do ps-all grep. So grep is like a search, and I'm gonna search for a certain package. Coding, so com.codingwithmitch.com dot mvvm recipes app. I believe that uh, that's the pack. It's recipe recipe app, not recipes app. So if I search that, I should get one entry and there it is. So now this is the, this is the process. Uh, which one's the process? I think this one's the process ID of the, um, the app that's running on the Linux operating system. I think that's the process ID. That might be the process ID. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the process ID is. One of those are the process ID, but it makes no difference. We can now kill the process. So kind of like kill the app by writing am kill and then com coding with Mitch dot mvvm recipe app so now if i if i type that and i and now i check for that process one more time so i'm doing ps dash a grep and then looking for the package notice it's gone the reason it's gone is because that process is is dead that app is killed essentially it does it is not running anymore so now if i was to look at our application again so i'm going to go to uh, go to the phone and just relaunch the application so i'm clicking on mvvm recipe app now it's what uh, what should happen is it should launch and be in the same state that uh, that it was in before the process died. But as you can see, it's not. We don't have our category selected. The list position is like somewhere random. It is it is not in the same state as when we left it. So this is this is the quote unquote process death issue. If the user is using the phone and for some reason the process dies, and we're going to talk about why a process might die in a second and the user reopens the app, the, you know, it's not in the same state. It's kind of in some weird random straight state. So this is obviously not a good user experience. So the process doesn't just die. Like it's pretty uncommon for a process to die. And I know this is, this is sort of a heated topic. Like if you were to tweet at Zwinden on Twitter, for example, and to say like, process death isn't a big issue. He'd probably have a few things to say to you, but in my opinion, honestly, process death is not a very big issue. Like it should be handled for sure, but it's, it's not that easy for the process to die. Modern phones have a lot of resources. They have a lot of RAM. They, they have good hardware. It's very hard for the process to die. The only way a process dies is if you start running low on resources and it starts cleaning up the apps that are running in the background or maybe not being used and it would then kill the process to free up resources. This is not as easy 
you know, it, it doesn't happen that often. I did a test, for example, one time I try, I had an app open and I was trying to get the process to die. I had the pro the app open. I opened up Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I, I opened up a whole bunch of apps. Oh, Google maps. Also, I searched for locations on Google maps. I played around in Facebook. I uh, played around in YouTube. I was downloading videos on YouTube. I was watching stories on Instagram. I even tried to uh, upload, I even uploaded an image to Google maps. So like that is a very resource intensive operation. I did all of those things and the app still didn't kill the process. So it's, it's not as easy for the process to die as you might think. But again, it is something that should be handled because it, it can happen. All right, so now let's uh, let's handle process death. So let's go into recipe list event and let's create a new event. This event will be called restore state event and it'll be a recipe list event just like the others. And I'll write a little comment here that says restore after process death. So the the, the aim of, of uh, this you know process death restoration process is we wanna save any of the arguments that are needed for any particular fragment or view. And then when the process is, is restored, we want to use those arguments to kind of restore the state of the app into what it was before the process died. So let's go into recipe list view model, and we're gonna use something called the saved state handle. So I'm gonna write at assisted, and don't worry, I'm gonna explain this. It's gonna look a little weird first, but again, I will explain this, so just hang on. Do assisted private value, saved state handle, and then just call it save state handle. So what is this saved state handle, and why did I use this weird assisted annotation? Well, let's refer to the documentation. So here we are in the documentation for saved state handle. It's uh, the URL is up here. It's just reference Android X lifecycle saved state handle. So if we scroll down to the description here, it says a handle to saved state passed down to the view model. You should use saved state view model factory if you want to receive this object in the view models constructor. This is a key value map that will let you write and retrieve objects to and from the saved state. So, um, oh, also here, this is important. These values will persist after the process is killed by the system and remain available via the same object. So this is very important. So not only, you could think of this as like a better version of saved instant state. So in the past we had that, you know, saved instant state function that's available in fragments in activities. We would pass key value pairs to that instant state. And, you know, after the rotation, AKA the fragments destroyed, the activities destroyed, those arguments then get restored. So this is kind of a, a newer a newer and improved version of that because it will not only restore after uh, you know configuration changes or whatever, it will also restore after process death. So that's a very, very important thing. So now what about this uh, you know assisted annotation thing here? Well, if you go back to the documentation here again, notice here when it said you should use saved state view model factory if you wanna receive this object in the view models constructor. So that's what we're doing. Here we have, you know, the save state being passed as a constructor argument to the view model. So how does the view model know, you know, where to get this thing? So by default, it doesn't. That's the punchline. But because we are using hilt and view model inject on the constructor of the view model, we can very easily just inject it using at assisted and it will automatically kind of magically be available to us. If we weren't using hilt and we didn't have the view model inject annotation, this would not work. We would not be able to just pass it as a constructor argument. We'd have to build a factory. We'd have to build a view model factory it would be a much more involved process. So Hilt really makes things very easy for us. Okay, now let's work on uh, saving those key value pairs. So come up to the top here and create some constants. And I'll skip the video ahead here because I don't think it's really necessary for you to watch me type these out. So we need four keys, one to save the page, one to save the query, one to save the list position, and one to save the selected category. So when you're defining you know, the keys of the things that you need to save, you just need to think like, what are the things in the UI that I'm gonna need to restore after process death? So for us, the things that matter are the page. So we know like the pagination system, like which page we're on. We need the query, because that shows like up in the top bar. Like in the finished version of the app, if we had a search being done, we would need to know what that query parameter is. We need to know what the list position is because if I was, you know, scrolled to some place, we need to have that location restored after process death. So that's the list position. And then also the selected category. So that is the the essentially the chip that is selected up here because that still needs to be highlighted after the process or after um, the state is restored after process death. Now I'm going to build some setter function so that every time any of of these parameters change, like the, the page, the query, the list position, the selected category, anytime those things change, they will automatically be updated in the saved state handle. So scroll down to the very bottom and do private function, let's do set list 
scroll position and do position and that will be an integer. Now do recipe list scroll position equals position and then do saved state handle and do dot set and do state key list position. So state key list position and then just pass that position. Now you're probably thinking, Mitch, this looks awfully like another function that we wrote. Uh, let me scroll up. It looks like uh, this one right here. It's doing the exact same thing. And yes, you're right. That's why in here now, what I'm gonna do is call set list scroll position and then just call position equals position. So essentially we've delegated what, what this function did to this setter function, which will also save it to the saved state handle. Now, keep in mind, I also, like I know I, if I wanted to, I could have just you know d taken this stuff and, whoops, I passed it, and just put this in here. That would have been the exact same thing. But for me personally, I like to kind of separate, separate out uh, what specific functions are for. So for this one, this is for, you know, what happens when we change the scroll position? Well, there's two things that actually need to happen, which is, you know, updating the scroll position and also updating the save state handle. Just a convention that I like to follow. It's up to you. You could have put the, both of them into the other function. It doesn't really matter. So now I'm gonna to write to the next one. So private function, we'll do set page. And we're doing the exact same kind of thing here. This.page.value equals the page. Then updating the saved state handle. Whoops, saved state handle, do dot set. Then state key the page and then do page onto, oh, actually then we need to uh, call set page in the on uh, increment page function or increment page function. So set page and then just do page.value plus one. So exactly the same kind of thing as we did with the on change recipe or on change uh, recipe scroll position function. Next private function set selected category. This will take a food category as input and this will be nullable. Now do selected category dot value equals the category and then, then do saved state handle dot set state state key selected category comma and then pass that category. Now look for wherever we set the uh, value. So selected category dot value. Look for that and we're going to replace that. So set selected category and then pass null. Now look for the next one. Um, was there just one? There should be more. Right here, selected category dot value. So set selected category, uh, selected category dot value, and then get rid of that previous uh, line there. Whoops, this should actually be, this should be new category. So new category. And I think that was it. Let me see. Uh, let's just look for selected category dot value again. Yep, that should be good. So now on to the next function. Next one will be the query. So private function set query. This will be query and it will be a string. Open this up. This dot query dot value equals the query and then save state handle. So saved state handle dot set. And we have the state key for the query and then just pass that query. Then of course, look for anywhere that this was called. So this query dot value, just do a search for that. Come up here, set query this, and just set it to whatever that query was. And we can delete that call, whoops, delete that call. So again, just looking for query and that should be good. So just that one place was, was calling that. So now no matter what, whenever any of these parameters change, they will also be updated in the save state handle. So now what about restoration? This deals with you know keeping track of the values, but how do we actually restore them? So let's go up into the init function and above the on trigger event, now we want to call you know save state handle for each one of our each one of our key value pairs. For the first one, we'll do an integer and do state key state key for the page. And if that value is not null, so let's check for that value and see if it's null, get P, which will be the page, do uh, set page, and then that will restore the page when the view model is built. So if the process dies, basically, the view model will be destroyed. And then when the process is recreated, the view model will be recreated. And it's gonna check for our key value pairs inside of the init function. Now we need to do the other three. So I'm just pasting this three more times. I'm gonna change the argument. This one will be you know, state, state key query. So state key query. This will not be P anymore, let's do Q. And then just do set query and set that equal to Q. Now the next one here, we'll do another integer and this will be the list position. So state key list position. Uh, we can do P here again, I guess, for list position. And then here we'll do set list scroll position, set that equal to P. And then the last one here, this will be a food category. Whoops, food category. We'll do state key, state key food or selected category. 
And instead of P, we'll do C for category, and then just do set selected category. So set selected category and then C, and then that new search event will be triggered. So actually that doesn't make sense either because if the process died and if it is restored, we don't want to do a new search event, we want to restore the previous state. So how do we know if you know the process died? If we were currently we were doing something before and the process died, we can check the scroll position. So I can say recipe list scroll position. If that does not equal zero, then we know that the user was doing something. They were scrolling around. They were just doing something. I guess that's really all it means. So else will on trigger the event for the new search event. And then if they were doing something, so currently before the process died, they were doing something. Then we want to just restore the the uh, the state. So we're going to call our restore state event uh, case inside of our uh, recipe list event class here. So now we need one last function, and that's the function that is going to be called when we restore the state. So let's come down here and add a new case inside of our on trigger event. This will be the restore state event, and we need to call a new function that we're going to build. So we'll call it restore state. And we haven't built this yet. We're going to build this right now. So private suspend function. We'll call it restore state. It will take nothing, return nothing do loading dot value and set that equal to true. Now this is a little tricky because in the API, you can only retrieve like each page of, of results per request. So what we need to do is retrieve the results for each page. Like if the user was viewing page three, we need to get page one, page two, page three and append them all to a single list. So do value results. This will be a mutable list object mutable list of recipes, set that equal to mutable list of. Now I wanna do four page in one up until page dot value. So we're gonna search through each page and query the API. Now keep in mind in you know a production application, we wouldn't be doing this, we wouldn't be, you know, iterating through each page and then querying the API, what we, what we would have done is we would have cached those results into the local database and we would be retrieving them from the cache. We would not be querying the API, but because we don't have a cache in this app, obviously we have to get it from the API. Also, you might be thinking, why didn't we save the list to the saved instance state or to the save state handle? That is a no-no. There's a limit to how much data you can save in the save state handle. Uh, two megabits, I believe is the, the maximum, which is only 250 kilobytes. So if you had a list of data, that is very easily gonna go over that limit. I think probably, you know, depending on the data structure, but very unlikely that it's going to hold more than, you know, a hundred list entries. So it's just not a, never save list entries to the save state or the save state handle. That's a big no, no, because it, you're going to go over the limit. So what you have to do is do what we're doing here. You save the query, you save the page number, and then you re-query it from the cache. In our case, we don't have a cache. So we're querying it from the API. So now value result equals repository dot search token equals the token, the page equals P from the loop up above, uh, query equals query dot value. So that'll be the first page of results or whatever loop iteration we're in. And then do results dot add all and add the result. That'll add, you know, uh, list entries zero to 30. And then the next loop entry will be, uh, you know, 30 to 60. Next will be uh, 60 to 90 and so on and so on, depending on how many pages the user had scrolled to. So do P equals page dot value. So if P equals the current pagination, that means we're done. So here I'd write, you know, done. We've got all of the, we've got all the recipes. And in that case, we would do recipes dot value equals the results. And then also we could uh, finish loading. So do loading dot value and set that equal to false. So that should be it. If I'm not mistaken, I think, uh, I think we're good to go here. So I guess let's run it and we'll see if I made any mistakes. All right, so here's the app running. Let's uh, perform a search. So I'm gonna click on chicken and I'm going to scroll down. So that'll be page number two, scroll down. Let's go to page number three. Just wanna make sure that we you know, get a whole bunch of results so I can really see if the process was restored or the state was restored. Now let's open up the command line. I'm gonna first take a look and see if we, well actually, sorry, first I wanna send this to the background. So remember to test process death, you gotta send this thing to the background. Now we open the command prompt and I'm gonna click enter and see if that process is running. Yes, there we go, we do have a process running. Now I'm gonna kill the process, so am kill and then the process name. Now I'm gonna check again to see if that process is running. 
No, it's not running. So we know that yes, we have successfully killed the process. Now we're going to relaunch the application. So let's go to the app here. I'm going to pull this up, launch the app, and we should be in the same state as when, as before the process died. So it looks good right away. We see that the, the search chicken is up here. We see that our category is still selected and also the list position is restored. This is exactly how we left the app before the process died. So that's it. We have successfully handled process death. If for some reason the phone decided that we don't have enough resources to run this app, kills the process. If the user reopens it, it's still gonna be in the same state as when they left it. Before I go, I just wanna mention, or I wanna remind you that process death isn't that big of a deal. It's actually very, very unlikely that the phone is gonna kill the process, but it does happen. It is something that should be handled. It happens, but again, it's very, very unlikely. And if you think about you know, most use cases also, like if the user is doing something, for the phone to kill the process, it's probably because they sent it to the background, they forgot about it for like an extended period of time. The app said, okay, they obviously don't care about this, so let's kill the process they probably aren't even gonna care. They're probably gonna open it up and say, oh, I haven't opened this for a while. Hmm, it's not in the same position. Oh, well, I, I they must have, you know, I don't know, it seems like, it seems like not a big deal. But again, it's, it is something that needs to be handled. Now you know how to handle it. Don't forget your like, don't forget your engagement. Leave me some kind of random engagement, doesn't matter, but you must leave some engagement. You can tell me what you had for breakfast. You can tell me what you had for lunch. You can even tell me what you had for dinner or dessert. Tell me something, engage with the video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, what are you still doing here? The video is over. Well, since you're still here, I guess I'll show you the best Android courses that exist on the planet. I got all kinds of high quality courses. If you scroll on down on the homepage, there's the Jetpack Compose one that you're watching right now. There's that course. We have MVI architecture, if you've ever been curious about that. We have my classic powerful Android apps with Jetpack architecture. This shows you everything from, uh, well, the focus on this one is pretty much database caching. caching. We get data from a real API, we cache it, we uh, basically design an app to work when there's no network connection. That is what this project is all about. We have some UI testing, another UI testing, Hilt, which uh, we actually went over in this course. We got clean architecture. This one's probably the best, this is definitely the best course on my website. If you are a professional or you are looking to get into the industry, the skills that you learn in this course are absolutely fundamental. This will give you a big edge in any job environment, whether you're applying or you're already at a job and you wanna just improve your skills. This is a really, really, really high quality course. It's hard, your, your brain might explode while watching it, but you will learn a lot. You'll learn a lot of really, really fundamental skills you know, anything from getting data from the network, caching data, designing different layers, abstracting out the different layers so that you can write unit tests, uh, espresso tests, so UI tests, dagger, navigation components, everything. It's beautiful. Definitely this is the best course on the website.